In this Digital Domination Summit Master Course, we talk with Brian Kurtz. He talks about the light bulb moments that changed his career and his company in its 30 plus year career in direct marketing after sending billions of promotions, selling millions of products. He talks about what it worked, what didn't work, that and much more coming up right now. Right, here we are. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. Welcome to the Digital Domination Super Summit. This is where some of the smartest minds in tech share lessons and actual tips to improve your business. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with successful entrepreneurs and leaders. Everyone who's live, put your name in, where you're from. Put all your questions in there throughout. I'm going to be pulling them in and asking them. And also we'll have questions in the live chat at the very end. I want to introduce our special guest today. It's Brian Kurtz. He's Executive Vice President at Boardroom Inc., which at its height was a $150 million company. He's overseen the mailing of approximately 1.3 billion pieces of direct mail over the past 30 plus years. And he's going to talk about what works, what doesn't work, some of his light bulb moments in his journey. And he knows a thing or two about marketing, copywriting, and you know what makes one of the world's greatest list managers. Brian, thank you so much for being here. God, it's my pleasure. My pleasure that you'd have a direct mail guy at the Digital Domination Summit. Yes. You know, offline to online, online to offline. I want to find first, Brian, for you, what inspired you to get into this business? You know, it's it's funny. A lot of people in direct marketing in the 80s, it was a lot of people just sort of fell into the business. And, you know, I always told the joke that I was most likely, I was voted in my high school yearbook, most likely to become a list manager. Um, but that's not true because that would never happen because I didn't even know what a list manager was when I was in high school or college. And in fact, there was one line about direct marketing in my marketing textbook in college. So to say that you know I had my eyes set on direct marketing from day one would be lying. Um, I mean, I thought I was going to be either a baseball umpire or um, a film critic for the New York Times because I was big in movies and big in baseball. Um, and I decided to go into business, and I knew I had a, a propensity for selling. So I got involved in this company boardroom with Marty Edelston, who's probably um, one of the best sales people that's ever lived, uh, who never took advertising in his newsletter, different story. And what happened was he told me after a year working here, where I thought I would go into the editorial side after being an English major, he said I had a nose for marketing. And I think that's how I got into the business. You know, He saw that, and I love direct marketing because it's measurable, it's accountable, and the best people who are marketing online today who are hopefully listening today are marketing with an ROI in mind, a return on investment in mind, that they are actually all direct marketers. And so I would never trade, I think on my LinkedIn page it says, I love direct marketing is my first line. Mm -hmm. And it's because I love the feedback, I love the measurability, I love knowing what worked and doesn't work, and shoot me now if I was running a Super Bowl ad this Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. And so what um, do you find early on that you learned that was influential? Before we get into your talk and light bulb moments, what was something you learned early on from uh, Marty, one of your mentors that you remember? Oh, God. Marty, you know, he just passed away in October, so it's still a little raw. In fact, I, there's a, in, in, the, in the slides that I have, I have a, a great picture of him that fits into one of my stories. But, you know, Marty had an expression... You know, you only go through life once, you might as well be the world's best. He had a bunch of great expressions, but that was one of them. And, you know, for my first three or four years, I got into the list business, and he said, Brian, be the best list manager. You're, you you could be the best, best list manager in the world. I will say that the, uh, the competition wasn't all that stiff, um, so I, I stood out because he taught me. But he taught me all those lessons of connection with people, of really contributing to people, to really connect with them. Um, the way that you send notes. I mean, I still send a lot of, I still, personally, right now, I send a ton of handwritten notes to people. I connect with people at a, at a whole other level besides email. And that's not just because I came out of direct mail and I'm a dinosaur. It's because I know what it's about to connect with people. So I'd say that would be like an overriding umbrella thing from Marty. But boy, I'm doing a whole two-day event that's just going to talk about the lessons of Marty Edelston. So yeah. 
uh, I, be, I was very fortunate to have a mentor like that. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to for your words of wisdom on this. And I know anyone can apply what you're about to tell your great story. So I'll let you pull up. And I'll let you take it over from here. Um, the the presentation. All you have to do is hit the uh, I hit the present, present button. It's just it's just moving slow. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, gotcha. No worries. It should it's 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 coming up, and I apologize. That's good. We and, good. Uh, we're good. All right. I'll let All you right. take over. So it's um, light bulb moments is what Jer Jeremy and I came up with, which is you know sending billions of promotions, sending selling millions of products, and while some of it is direct mail, some of it is direct response TV, um, and some of it is digital. Um, I think the lessons here are big uh, in terms of direct response because, as I said, I think everything that we do today, um, online or offline, is all about direct marketing. It's all about measurable response. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to see, even if it's about something from the past in direct mail, that how, how much uh, it is applicable to what we do today. So my first light bulb moment is what I call new product development by renting a hand truck at Barnes & Noble uh, and the marriage of content and list. So basically in the 1980s, uh, Boardroom was known for our newsletters and then we created a whole book division which um, was basically the greatest hits of our newsletters. Uh, we were able to take uh, lots of content from our newsletters, create these huge books, I mean four, five, six hundred page books, sell them in direct mail, not sell them in retail at all or in the trade so we were able to get you know, $29 and $39 for these books and be able to sell them in solo direct mail, um, by solo meaning you know, single, single product direct mail, and sell hundreds of thousands of copies. Um, we didn't care about the New York Times bestseller list, we just cared about how much money we could make on these fantastic books with fantastic content. One of my mentors at the time, Gordon Grossman, I said to him, um, I don't know how we expand this business. I can only use the greatest hits from our newsletters. I'm having a hard time getting enough content to get new books. And Gordon said, and his famous quote was, which was the light bulb moment, I guess, why do you think that all of your content has to be your own? And so what I decided to do is that at that time, maybe we didn't have a 9 million name database that we have today of buyers and subscribers, but we probably had 3 or 4 million names. And basically, I realized that the stuff that we were selling them from our own content, there was a lot of content out there in the way of books that we could go out and find what would be the most applicable to our database. So I literally went with one of my associates to Barnes and Noble, um, to local Barnes and Noble, asked them for a hand truck, and they happened to have one in the back. And I went to every section of Barnes and Noble, every section of the bookstore that was a category that I thought would appeal to some portion of my database, whether it was finance whether it was uh, all kinds of health topics, whether it was, you know, uh, memory, whether it was, you know, any kind of, uh, a lot of the soft stuff, a lot of soft psychology stuff, because all of that stuff we had covered in our newsletters. And after about, I think, about an $800 uh, invoice at the, at the cash register, uh, I took all of those books back to the office. Um, didn't, I didn't get to take them in the hand truck, so I had to put them in by hand in my car. And, and what I did was I started going through them and started looking at which books I thought would be applicable for direct mail. And by that, meaning what could a copywriter do to take information out of those books that create to create really exciting direct mail copy. So we narrowed down the books we bought to a different groups and we started sending them out to our best copywriters and we were connected to the best ones in the world. And what began was a whole division at Boardroom, which was books that other people had that before I put them on that hand truck were just collecting dust on shelves at Barnes & Noble. If they were lucky, they were selling 5,000 copies and maybe even 10 and calling it a bestseller. And we developed a whole line of books that way. Uh, we had one health book in particular, I remember, we sold 800,000 copies just in direct mail because the copywriter fell in love with it. We were able to take the book, it was a soft cover that I got from Barnes & Noble. We created a hardcover version of it. Um, we started adding premiums, other small books to go with it from our own content because now I didn't have to do our own content for a 600-page book. I got the 600-page book at Barnes & Noble and I put our own content and our own spin mm -hmm. on it with the premiums and I developed these incredible direct mail packages, not personally of course, I'm not, I wasn't the copywriter, um, but that was basically new product development by renting a hand truck at Barnes & Noble. And I think that the idea of what the, how that applies today, of course, is 
that knowing what your audience wants, knowing what might be out there that's under-marketed or undervalued, and you have the marketing muscle to bring it to the market, um, I think there's tremendous lessons here. I will tell you that I, I, I go into even more detail about this whole process uh, in an interview I did with Perry Marshall, which I think we're going to direct people, Jeremy, to to that um, to that interview at the end. So if I, I, I'm going to I'm going to go off to light bulb number two now. Yeah, I have a light quick question on light bulb one. That's remarkable that you sold 800,000 of the books. Now, how does it no, work? No, no, that was 800,000 of one book. Of one book, of, right? Of one book. Of I one sold book. millions and millions of books that we did this way. But the biggest one was one that we sold, one title that had sold, I think, maybe 20,000 copies at Barnes and Noble and in the trade that we sold 800,000 copies of at a higher price than what was being sold in the bookstore with additional content that we put together for the direct mail package. Yeah. The question I had for that is, can you walk me through briefly of, do you start off contacting the author or what do you do to start? Oh, so basically I started with going to the categories in the store and finding the books. Mm -hmm. Once I saw the books that I wanted and I, and I started, what I, the first thing I did, I, I knew instinctively that the John Wileys and the Harper Collins of the world, you know, all these big, big publishers, that if I went to them for a deal that says I want to buy the direct mail rights to your book and I'll pay you a 5% royalty, that most of them are going to say yes because it's found money for them. It's a channel that they're not using. And as I said, you know, I could, I could explain to them how I just had to dust the book off because it was sitting on the shelf. So the sale, the, 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 the way to present it to the publisher, that was kind of the, that was the mechanics of it, but that was pretty easy. Um, the big part was, was the content good enough for our copywriters to cull enough good information to write killer direct mail copy? And so I never, I never had a situation where I found a book that I wanted to do in direct mail and couldn't get the rights to. So you just approach them and you, you kind of just tell them uh, as far as you'll, you'll make a deal um, Absolutely. as far as they'll get yeah. right. No, they, they sell subsidiary rights all the time. In fact, they have all, all these publishers have a department. I mean, you could buy the subsidiary rights to a chapter. You could buy all, all kinds of stuff. So, you know, the idea – and in a lot of cases, I bought direct marketing rights, not just direct mail rights which gave me the opportunity, if I wanted to, to sell in direct response TV and in, on the internet later on. So at the beginning when I did this, the internet wasn't doing, <laughs> there wasn't much of an internet. So I only needed direct mail at the time, and, and I, but I did, I did ask for direct mail rights. As time went on, I always asked for direct marketing rights. A lot of times they wouldn't give me that because they might want to hold on to the online rights. But again, a lot of times these books were already as I said, sitting on the shelf, not doing much. So it was a, it was kind of a non-producing asset for the publishers, and I was basically opening up a whole new market for them. So they would give me the option to do direct marketing rights, and I think in one case we did test a book that I bought the rights to this way that we tested on TV. It didn't work, but we, because the books we rolled out to on TV, no, as a matter of fact, that's not true. One of the books we rolled out to in an infomercial was a book that I originally got the rights to this way and we just paid them the same rights for the TV sales as we did for the direct mail sales. I mean, originally, I mean, that's a genius idea. I mean, people can go on and uh, think about that online and not have to come up with all your own ideas, but other, you know, quality information is out there. But how did you know, this is the first time you had done this at that time, how did you even know what to offer the, the publisher? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we, had, I mean, we had done books in the 80s. Marty had made deals with certain authors um, who had written like you know very esoteric tax books and stuff, and Marty had told me that he had made a deal once um, with one of the authors and he gave him ten percent royalty, and Marty said you know I blew it. I found out afterwards that the basic direct mail royalty and direct marketing royalty is about five percent. Um, so I knew the ballpark already. Um, so that was a piece of information I had. It wasn't the light bulb moment because I had to put all of this together. Mm -hmm. But I knew also that there were other publishers out there that had thought about the concept of buying subsidiary rights. I mean, that, that had been around for a while. And then when I found out, I did a little research, I found out that 5% was a going rate. So I knew where my starting point was. Now, I did talk to someone else in the book business that said that um, they did some deals at 25 to 4%. Um, so depending on how desperate you think the... Uh, the publisher might be, you probably could go less than five. I will tell you this though, and here's another one of my rules of thumb in business. I am never 
you know, and Marty taught me this, you know, not it, being a pig never gets you anywhere. And so I knew that if I could make the thing work at 5% and 5% was a fair royalty, um, I knew I was going to do the fair royalty. And Marty Edelston told me on his deathbed, um, I was I was trying to, he was, he was kind of out of it, but he definitely could hear me. And I was telling him about a deal I was working on. And the one thing he said to me, this is two days before he died. And he said to me, Brian, always be fair. Yeah. I'm the fair I'm known as the fairest guy in direct marketing. Yeah. I could tell I, that by your personality. I, I sleep very well at night, I will tell you that. Um the other question I had was, uh, Brian, kind of in regards to that. Now obviously the book's for sale. Are you selling it for the same or more when you go oh, you to always, direct mail? Oh, you can always get more. In most cases the book was already sitting on a remainder shelf in Barnes and Noble or wherever and it was in a soft cover version the first thing I did was figure out how I'm gonna make how I'm gonna bulk the book up in one case the one that I sold 800,000 copies I actually did once I made the deal with the publisher I went to the author who was a doctor and I started talking to him about can we put a new chapter in here can we bulk it up a little bit so it doesn't look like the book exactly as it was in the in, in Barnes and Noble and I call it the apples to oranges comparison. Mm -hmm. Remember I said before that we also would put a couple of premiums. We do a couple of small books to go with the big book. So the combination of taking the book and putting it into hardcover if it was soft cover, it may be adding a chapter or two, but certainly adding some premiums, some so soft cover books that go with the big book. Now I've got an offer for $39 and the book in Barnes and Noble was probably being discounted for $17.95. Yeah. And there was no way, and, and our books never went on Amazon unless you found them on a remainder, and our books never were found in the bookstores again because the product that we created for direct mail and direct marketing became its own product. It became, again, I call it apples to oranges marketing. So the apple was the book sitting on the shelf collecting dust, and the orange was the direct mail product, which was a hardcover version with premiums, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. No, that's really powerful. So you repurposed it and then added, bulked it up, so added even more value to it. Correct. And char, right. and but we had to get a higher price because the margins in direct mail were tight. So I couldn't sell for seventeen ninety five in 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 direct mail. So it was actually out of necessity that I had to sell it at thirty nine dollars. Yeah, and I know today even people are you know obviously doing books and they'll you know they'll bulk up the value, create video modules or you know, audio modules and, and doing that way on, online. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And as I said, I mean, it's harder to get full three, so I call 360 direct marketing rights for this type of thing today. I think the concept is sound in terms of going out to find other product to sell to your database that's not your own. That's sort of the big lesson here. And that was the light bulb. But the actual use of the content and the kind of deals you can make, I mean, the internet is definitely, you know, I do think this internet thing will catch on. Um, so I think that uh, getting you know full 360 rights that includes online is going to be a lot more difficult today than it was in 19, you know, even in the 90s. So yeah. right or late late 90s. Yeah, but there's still a lot of opportunity out there for someone totally. who's not selling. Their, I mean, you can go on Amazon and probably search and see. Okay, who hasn't been selling this? Or it's amazing content, and they just need someone to kind of get it out there. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I think um, um, inventor societies, these you know, these inventors. You know, when I used to go to the uh, ERA show, which is the infomercial trade show, um, Electronic Retailing Association, and there was always an aisle at that show in the exhibit hall of inventors. And the inventors, it was almost like you walked down. I was the guy with, you know, in this case, I was the guy with the with the bankroll to to look for product, and. Going down that aisle, you feel like you're going to get attacked because um, they're incredible inventors with incredible ideas with, A, no marketing muscle, and B, when I say marketing muscle, they have no idea how to bring their product to market, and B, they don't have the money to invest in either direct mail or direct response. To, in this case, it was direct response television. You know, they didn't have $200,000 to do an infomercial. So, yeah, there's there's... There's content. Content is obviously all around us. I mean, Gary Vaynerchuk throws out numbers about the amount of content that gets produced per day is, you know, what was produced like in, in, in you know, centuries worth in the past. And he's got a great number for it. But yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of opportunity there. So I'll let you go to tell us about light bulb number two. 
So light bulb number two is I, I said what they don't want you to know about how to make infomercials work or how watching TV at 2 a.m. led to a $300 million business or follow the anecdotal evidence. Um, so I put a picture up here of a book by a guy by the name of Kevin Trudeau, Natural Cures They Don't Want You to Know About. Um, unfortunately, I think Kevin is in jail at the moment. Um, but I, And I put this up here because you know, inspired ideas do come from anywhere. And, I, I, and while I did not imitate Kevin's business, um, I have to give credit where credit's due in that he gave me the, the light bulb moment was watching Kevin on TV at two in the morning. So the the big the background on this, and again, this this case history is also outlined in that interview with Perry Marshall, which I'm going to give people access to. So I'll probably do a little less detail here, so we can get to all the light bulbs. But the the, the short version of this is that I always wanted to be in the infomercial business from the day that I saw Tony Robbins selling his his incredible program in the late 1980s and the reason why I fell in love with the infomercial business is that I had a brand bottom line personal that was not well known you know I wasn't Sports Illustrated I couldn't sell on TV with a with a football phone so I needed 28 and a half minutes to tell my story just like my direct mail was longer direct mail I didn't do you know four page letter direct mail I did 24 page magalogs and bookalogs and you know very very extensive copy uh, well, copy intensive direct mail because I have a story to tell. Nobody knows the bottom line brand. So I always knew that I wanted to be in the infomercial business. I tried to be in the two minute TV business, short form, for years, never was able to do it. I even met with uh, Bill Guthy and Greg Ranker, who were the kings of the infomercial business, uh, back in the late 1980s in, in the Tony Robbins era. And I thought maybe I had to put together 20 or 30, you know, boardroom books or, a, or DVDs or in that it, back then it was VHS. Um, but I needed a program like the bottom line better life program or something. So I tried all kinds of stuff. I never got a Guthy or Ranker to bite. I kind of always thought in the back of my mind I wanted to be in this business. And then circa 2004, I'm up late one night watching Kevin Trudeau and he's selling one book for $29.95, the book you see on this screen. And I'm thinking, how is he doing that? I could easily put one book on screen and sell it for 30 bucks, but how do you make money on that? Infomercials are expensive. And then I called the toll-free number where I was preceded. I think I, my joke was I was on the phone for about two and a half weeks. Um, <laughs> but basically, uh, what, what they did was it was all about the back end, obviously. And so I was on the phone for a long time. I bought every upsell they had just to see how they went through. I think, at the, I, think I spent a few hundred dollars, even though the book was $29. So what did they, they went, walk you through? So you went to buy the book. What happened next? So, you know, they, they get me. They get your name and address quickly. They, um, it wasn't like Boiler Room. It was, you know, good in, it was a good inbound telemarketing. But basically they said, well, you know, you're getting the book. It's twenty nine ninety five. Would you like, you know, it's like, would you like the, would you like the premium Snuggie as opposed to the regular Snuggie? So in this case, would you like the, the the audio version of Kevin's book it's on CD and that was another twenty nine dollars and then I think there was some kind of transcript of the diet plan because it was there's there's a there's a diet involved with this and then by the time you know you got down it 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 went all the way down to uh, there was an auto club there was a travel club there was a discount card for Walmart um, so it had nothing to do with the original product. And now I realize where the economics were here. And then when I did some research, I found out that I think Kevin on a $29 book, I think his average sale was well over 100 bucks. But what that meant to me, when I say follow the anecdotal evidence, what that meant to me is that I could do this now on my own terms. So what I did was we created, and, and I just put a bunch of pieces together. I got the best infomercial producer I knew who was someone who I had been in touch with and stayed in touch with. Uh, for years, who I always wanted to work with. He knew all the people to go to in terms of media buying. And we basically became infomercial experts overnight. Um, over three years, this is what got our company to $150 million in one year from $70 million. And that was just in year one in 2005 and 2006. Um, we were told that one in 20 infomercials work. We got three of our first four to work. Um, and the way we got them to work is that we did, as I said, we did them on our terms. We had shows that, and I'll talk about that in a second on the next slide on light bulb three on how we use the physical product. But basically, the 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 lesson here was that 
I saw a way to do it. Now, our average order, I only wanted to sell other boardroom, you know, bottom line or boardroom books on the back end of our health book on the infomercial. So I didn't want to go down to the Walmart discount cards, which would have paid for a lot of a lot of telemarketing expense. It would have, you know, covered a lot more than what we ended up covering. But I got to sixty-five or seventy dollars average order. But by but all I did was sell more content. I sold more of our good health content, um, and that's all I sold. Yeah, you I never to keep got it true to the brand and keep it true to the content, and not exactly. kind of go off on tangents, even though it mean more dollars. Correct, and and that's not saying that what what. What they what Kevin did was wrong uh, by any means. That was that fit with what he wanted to do because his model then took the book into retail. His book and that book that you see on the screen there ended up in Barnes and Noble at you know sixty percent off eventually, and he and he, he he moved millions of books through 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 retail and through the trade. That wasn't our game. Our game was to not only work in direct response TV at that higher price. That remember the thirty nine dollar price I told you in light bulb number one. But then I'm going to show you in the next slide how we then turned it into a multimedia extravaganza and brought it back to direct mail and also brought it onto uh, banner advertising online. So our business philosophy and how we were going to handle the back end here was more about the long view and not about blowing this out, which is a big thing in the infomercial business. A lot of it is, you know, basically they're not one hit wonders, but you end up being a four-hit wonder. So you you get the you get the big hit on TV, you blow it out on TV, and then you move it to retail, and then it fizzles out, and you're done. Um, that wasn't our game. We were in business for the long haul because of our direct marketing business and our direct marketing heritage in other media. And, and of course, that's the lesson of multimedia and why you don't want to just be in one medium, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. And I'll let you to move on to light bulb three, but just what I love, you know, what you say here is. You know, you took something, you know it's working, and you actually personally follow through that marketing process and marketing channel. And anyone out there, whether it's direct mail, online, you know, infomercial, you can go to what maybe it's a competitor, maybe it's someone you admire, a company you admire, and just go through that sales process and see what they actually do that's working. Yeah, no, and it's also, you know, speaks to the value of in, of swipe files. I mean, in direct mail, we've been talking about, you know, we, we live with swipe files, meaning we look at every, what everybody else is doing all the time. And just so, just for the record, though, there's a big difference between stealing and stealing smart. Um, and so I'm not recommending you take somebody and you rip off what they do, but there's a lot to be learned. I mean, I saw Kevin Trudeau sitting at a desk and then I saw him sitting on two stools being interviewed. And then I saw a Charlie Rose interview uh, on, on, on a different channel, which was not an infomercial. And we put all of that together. And that's how we came up with our format with Hugh Downs, which I'll talk about now in Lightbulb 3. Right. So Lightbulb 3 is, I said, the day two years ago, an internet marketer told me the deep, dark secret of selling physical products. Actually, I heard that one for the first time in 1981. So the story behind this was that I was sitting in um, an, an internet marketing seminar and the speaker was actually going to talk about, this is two years ago, the deep dark secret about selling physical products to an IM audience, to an internet marketing audience. And it just, you know, I almost, I was sitting next to another dinosaur, a friend of mine, and we almost fell off our chair. And when, by the way, when I use the term dinosaur, I'm using it in a really, really positive way. <laughs> so if people think that I'm ever going to go extinct, they're crazy. Um, but the, the knowledge that I had about what physical product can do, especially on the back end, even for digital product, things that start digitally, I think is a huge thing that's an oversight when it comes to what people are doing online today. Um, and I'm not saying that leading, I think leading with digital product is sweet. I mean, you know, the profit margins are better, the, you know, the engagement can be better, the cross-sell, upsell can be easier with one click. All of that, I don't, you know, if I sat here and told you, you know, go do hardcover books and forget digital content, you might as well take me off this interview now. That's not where I'm going. Where I'm going is, and it's an interview, I just did an interview with Joe Polish, my good friend, about, I said, everybody's going right, time to go left. And it was really about direct mail. And I wasn't saying get into the $39 book direct mail business. What I was saying is get into the business of treating your customer in a way that deserve that sometimes they actually deserve physical product and there are tons of examples online today 
that you see situations where people give away the digital content and where they make their first bit of money is when they sell either the either the DVDs of that content or at least they sell some version of that content as opposed to give it, first they give it away free and then they sell it. And I know a particular situation that was a million dollar launch online that gave away a free documentary screening online for two weeks and the bulk of the million dollars w that got sold was a DVD of the movie wow. that people were able to watch for free online for a period of time. So I just don't want people to forget about physical product. I was glad that a 100% internet marketer was telling me that deep dark secret two years ago, but the light bulb for me went off you know, very early on in 1981. Now the the screenshot here, just a just to, you know, kind of feed off of of light bulb number two. Um, first, you have Hugh Downs, who was our spokesperson. So the credibility factor made a huge difference uh, on our infomercial. We were able to then sell the physical product, which is the book, The World's Greatest Treasury of Health Secrets. We had direct mail. Um, we had direct mail that wasn't all that great uh, for the Treasury of Health Secrets at the time, and after the infomercial. Uh, the third piece there, it says Urgent Health News, it says Meet the Greatest Medical Team Ever Assembled. We basically took the infomercial and created a direct mail piece around it and a direct mail program that was dead ended up being one of the best mailings we had done in many, many years and we ended up selling not only you know three million books on TV, we probably sold another, after the TV, we sold another million, million five in direct mail and then on the far right, which you can't see well, is um, um, is the, uh, the the banner ads that we did for the book. And we started, I think the bottom one is a picture of Hugh Downs, says Hugh Downs Special Reports. I mean, for a while, we were on the Weather Channel, and we were in all the places that you'd never expect, you know, dinosaur marketer, bottom line boardroom to be selling a hardcover book. And we were selling a hardcover book, and we sold another million plus books online uh, wow. through banner advertising and all all the stuff that we did there um, so I just uh, I just think this is an interesting case history again the whole case history of how we got into the infomercial business is, is detailed even more in that interview with Perry but I think I think you get the sense of how this became a multi-channel extravaganza and my joke is always if I was able, able to be as multi-channel in my career with everything I've done that we did here with the Treasury of Health Secrets, um, you wouldn't be talking to me because I'd probably be retired on some on some island somewhere. Maybe for a month, but then you'd be, get bored and you'd want to talk about what you did. Just you're absolutely right, show. actually. You, you, know, you, uh, you, you have, the, you have, the, you have the, the, the distinct pleasure of knowing me way too well. <laughs> and uh, I have no intention. In fact, my next 30-year career is going to be better than the first 30-year career. So in that case, um, you know, anyone can do you. Did the multi-channel approach, which is from you know infomercial, direct mail, and then the online component. So incorporating all of it, and also a lot of people forget that physical aspect because we're so used to that this digital age. But that is like you're saying, everyone's going left, you go right. They get something in their hands, and it's sort of like a wow factor because they're not used to getting it. Totally. And there's I, there's an interview on my site, which I think you can also have your folks they can download for free, which is exactly that. Everyone's going right, time to go left, which is a uh, the interview I did with Joe Polish about, you know, using direct mail more on the back end of infomercial of of um even on you know for online marketers. Yeah. So light bulb four. Light bulb four. Persistent aggressive marketing is not stubborn or bullheaded, or how we went from loser mailing to loser mailing to mailing over 20 million pieces of direct mail for the same book. So what's on the left side here, 1726 Best Kept Secrets in America, is a mailing package for a book that we call The Great Book of Inside Knowledge. Before we mailed that, which would have been to the left of this, which I, didn't have, I couldn't find in the archives, was actually a book that was called The Book of Checklists. And the book of checklists was something that Marty, whose picture is in the middle, which I'll explain in a minute, um, Marty is the master of secrets. Marty, when we positioned him in our direct mail, we always positioned him as the bloodhound. He was the guy that was going to get you the information that no one wanted you to know. Um, so he also was so um, obsessed with checklists, and we know today that people live with checklists. They live with to-do lists. It's still 
you know, there's all these. I have I have a couple of great apps that I've gotten online to kind of track my 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 wins per my, what wins I have per day and all my different things. So Marty instinctively knew that he wanted to do a book of checklists. So he did the book of checklists. Um, it was a disaster in direct mail. Um, for whatever reason, people didn't want to hear about checklists. Probably they thought it was too much work. Check, they have enough checklists. There's exactly. It was like not position. So then the 1726 Best Kept Secrets in America was the same book retitled. Uh, and the title of the book is the best. It was the, bo um, the book of privileged information. But it was still the same direct mail package. And that was a little bit better than the book of checklists, but it was pretty bad. So then... Marty and I looked at each other and said, you know, the book is great. Um, you know, the content is fantastic. Just because it's a bunch of checklists, the, the actual checklist in the book is like basically a life manual. And Marty just looked at me and he goes, it is just an amazing book of secrets. And so then we said, you know what? Let's not just retitle the book, The Book of Secrets, but let's go out to our best copywriter. And that was a guy by the name of Mel Martin at the time who – was our secret weapon. There's an article online somewhere that the 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 the, the most the most uh, famous copywriter that no one ever knew, and it was Mel Martin because he was the guy that Marty and I just used exclusively for boardroom. And what's on the right there, which says how to refund airlines non-refundable ticket, how to make your car very very hard to steal, vitamins never to buy at a health food store, never um, and and uh, uh, to know when, uh, how to know when a slot machine is ready to pay off. No why do you include, I have a quick question on that. So yeah. why do you include that one as the last one? I would think if you include it as the first one and everyone's like, wow, how do I know when a slot machine is ready to pay off? Well, I, I, I didn't decide the order on that. Oh, the order. Oh, that's interesting. You can test. We, we tested it. Um, I don't know if we ever tested slot machine first, um, but we found that airline fascinations, we had a famous one, what never to eat on an airplane, which is a famous bottom line headline. And we knew instinctively at the time that airlines, uh, st stuff about air travel was really big with our audience at the time. Hmm. So I think these are actually in the order that we felt were the best. We had another one on there for a while that was how to outwit a mugger in a, in a self-service elevator, which is one of my personal favorites. But anyway, the point is that that, that piece on the right that, that I just read to you uh, ended up mailing over 20 million pieces of direct mail. We changed the name of the book to the Book of Secrets from the Book of Privileged Information, which was originally the Book of Checklists. The book did not change at all. It's the book you see in the picture in the middle with Marty, who was a black belt in karate. He's smashing a board in between two stacks of the Book of Secrets. And actually, there's a picture. That, that picture I just got out of his house recently from his wife, who gave it to me um, as a cherished possession that I will now have on my wall forever, because uh, that's Marty in his prime as a black belt in karate, slicing a board and over the, over the book that he and I together mailed 20 million pieces of direct mail for. And basically the lesson is that we knew we had a winner. The question is, it had, you know, Gary Halbert has a, had a great line, which was every, every, um, every marketing problem can be, so, can be solved with a great sales letter. And so going to Mel Martin, and I think also the whole what we call the fascination approach, which is on this envelope to the right, is something that we live by from this point. And we did it, we did it in pre, and if you look in the 1726 Best Kept Secrets in America, if you open that up, the, the actual copy inside is very what we call fascination oriented. It's got a lot of stuff that's sitting on that envelope on the right. But putting it not just on the envelope, but then really going after the hard-hitting fascinations on the inside of the envelope and repositioning the book as a book of secrets um, was the difference between a book we would have given up on and one of the best-selling books we ever did. So yeah. I think there's a lot of lessons about, you know, just because it's, it's not if you, you know, don't succeed, try, try again. It's you got to do it intelligently. You got you to you have world-class copy. You got to marry you got to marry all of all of what you got. You got you know you got to take all of your resources and put them to use um, if you really believe. And Marty was just he wasn't bullheaded. He was just an amazing um, just an amazing amazing marketing person. And uh, so you asked me a question about Marty. Uh, I got um, I've got tons of stories like this. That's why I have to do a two day event about it. Right. Uh, I'm doing it with Dan Kennedy, by the way. Uh, who was That's going to be exciting. Yeah, and he was a big admirer of Marty as well. And we're going to do a whole day just on, on basically the future of what well, we think the future of direct marketing is, based and it's going to be based on the lessons of Marty Edelston. 
Yeah, that's going to be amazing. So I'm going to go to light bulb five. Light bulb five. Your database of customers are real people. The breakthrough thinking about multiple control packages, and there's an asterisk, and it says different people need to be talked to differently. So maybe everybody on the, on this uh, call right now is saying a big duh, you know, well, Brian, tell me something I don't know, and you would be amazed. Um, because now I've gotten under the covers of a bunch of different online marketing businesses of how many people, even big list, small list, it doesn't matter, uh, that they speak with one, one voice, one promotion, one language when they have subgroups in their list that they don't even know about. This particular story, I said the story of paranoid versus optimistic controls, came about because on the on the left is the paranoid, uh, the world crisis of 1986. That's a sales letter for bottom line personal. And on the right is free how to do everything right, which is also a sales letter for bottom line personal. And that's the premium that we gave away. It's a booklet called how to do everything right that you get free with your subscription. What we found in the list universe that we were mailing for bottom line personal, that there were different people from different buckets coming in. And we found two very distinct buckets. One were people who were coming from more mainstream lists, I'll call it the Money Magazine, Consumer Reports, um, f uh, you know, fundraiser lists, uh, catalog lists, and then all of a sudden we started, rent we started mailing a few lists that were what I call opportunity seeker lists. They were you know, small lists, but people who were incredibly responsive direct mail people, but they weren't resonating with the how to do everything right message and we had this one package the world crisis of 1986 that we tested against how to do everything right and those opportunity seeker lists went through the roof the world crisis and yet they were dead on how to do everything right so I, I use this as a very granular example of we found out the marriage of the copy with the list and then we were able to have basically two controls control package meaning the package that goes out that's your best package and we actually had a whole new universe of opportunity seeker lists that only got mailed the world crisis package and then everybody else got the how to do everything right package the other little piece that we found out which was incredible was that the opportunity seekers because they're opportunity seekers didn't pay their bill we sold bottom line on a bill me offer where you got you got you got the free trial issue and then we sent you a bill for twenty nine ninety five or thirty nine dollars whatever the price point was and we'd get you know thirty forty pe you know some percentage of people to pay so we were finding that the world so you crisis, send it for free and they have to pay after they get it that's correct and that's how we sold a lot of our books you know by the way and this this is the st this is in the full story of the infomercial we sold those books on banner ads the same way which is amazing to say that we could sell a book on a free trial without getting a credit card up front and be profitable tells you the power of the marketing. It fizzled out after a while, but we were able to do bill me's, what we call bill me's. But the thing that we found out here is that the opportunity seeker guys weren't paying up at a high enough rate. So what we did on the world crisis package is that we turned it into a cash with order. They had to give us their credit card. And it still worked better than how to do everything right as a bill me offer, free offer, to the same list. Now, finding out all those things were all done through extensive testing, but it was also the big lesson, of course, is that there are different segments on your list that need to be talked to differently. And I don't care if your list is 9 million names like, it is, like ours is, or your list is 2 million like our email list is, or your list is 900 people who bought you know, a $10,000 product. Within that list, there might be some subgroups, and... You know, I always I have a lot of different examples of this, but there are certain people that deserve to be talked to in a completely different way, and certainly there are some that you want to invest a lot more money in if they've bought a lot more from you, which is probably a different topic for a different light bulb. But the light bulb here was specifically about different different messages to different universes of lists. Yeah, and I want you to, I'll have you go to the next light bulb, but I do want to ask a little bit about how you first discovered that um, and what the messaging was going to be, because how did you know it was paranoid versus optimistic? I mean, you, could... you know, we had always done a bit of paranoia. I mean, you saw it in that other package with the fascinations on the front. So paranoia, you know, we used to say paranoia is not a psychosis, it's survival. And we kind of knew instinctively that our folks were, generally paranoid because remember Marty was the watchdog who was going to tend the bloodhound 
who is going to tell them about all the different people, their lawyer, their accountant, all these different people all that are trying secrets. to rip. Yeah, the secrets of people like trying to rip you off, and we're going to give you the inside information. In fact, one of our we sold three million copies of a book called the Book of Inside Information. So we knew instinctively that was it. So we, in this particular case, we did stumble a little into it because we hired a copywriter who specialized in writing very paranoid copy to write a package for Bottom Line Personal. That was the world crisis of 1986. However, we knew that when we when we did the um, the list breakout for the list, we do nths of the different control the different test packages, and we knew that we had this these lists of opportunity seekers that were not responding as well to how to do everything right, but they were they were responding at a very high rate for the bill me offer, but they weren't paying up enough, so they weren't making money. So we were thinking. Let's send a group of those lists, the world crisis package. We might even get a higher front end response. And even if they don't pay up well, we're still going to be able to have a positive profit, profit on, on the list. And that's exactly what happened. Of course, the pay up was still not great. And that's when we went then to the cash offer. So all of that got tested into. But it really started with knowing our list universe, knowing our copywriters, knowing how our audience behaved somewhat but then trying to look for pockets of our database that will respond differently to different kinds of messaging. Yeah, yeah. Well, oftentimes we do use the same messaging, so that is powerful. Yeah, and email, it's so easy to change it. This was expensive to do. I had to do this in direct mail. I had to pay postage and printing. You know, in email, there's no excuse. It's cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Last time I checked, they're not charging for postage in email. <laughs> And light bulb six kind of gets into how you sell and get that response. Yeah, so this one I really want. This is very interesting. So how you sell is how they will respond. So this is the story about the survey package and the bookalog. Sounds like a fairy tale, right? The survey package and the bookalog went into the woods together or something. I don't know. And the huge direct marketing lessons we learned by mailing both in the millions. Um, so basically the um, – and I want to move through quickly because I know that we, I set my timer, so I know that we want to make sure we have time for Q&A. Um, so on the left side here, um, both the envelope and the, and the piece that you can't read that well, but I'll tell you what that is. Basically, the envelope says confidential survey and gift certificate and close four, and it was actually personalized. Um, you know, we call inkjet. You know, we laser printed the uh, name onto the envelope in a closed envelope, so it's very, very personalized. You can see it's a live stamp even though it's sent as a bulk rate. And then inside, it said gift certificate. And the first line said, I want your, I want your honest opinion. And basically, it was a survey that, that the certificate, they send the certificate back with their, and there's some survey questions. And the survey questions and the certificate started their subscription. So it was a little gimmicky. They knew they were getting into a subscription, although the disclaimer copy was there about that you're, you're starting a free subscription to Bottom Line Personal. Um, and the front end response to this was huge. I mean, we're talking five and six percent response rates. Written by one of the best copywriters who ever lived and who's still alive, and his name is Gary Bensavenga. And Gary wrote this package. He just thought it was a, a great hook to get more people to try Bottom Line Personal. The idea is to get as many people a free issue of Bottom Line as possible, and then they'll get hooked on the newsletter because it's so great. And then the pay up will, even if it's going to be low, it'll be high enough to pay out. Well, what we found with this package was it worked, and it was our control package for quite a while, but we got these 5%, 6% front-end responses, but we'd get 15 to 20% of the people to pay us. And so we just didn't fe it just didn't feel great being in a business where only 15 or 20% are paying because we're basically casting this incredibly wide net. So on the right, Gary came back to us and said, I'm going to now do a package. That's a book -along. That package on the right is 64 pages thick. It mails as a self-mailer. The addressing is on the other side of the little black book of secrets. And basically, it's a 64-page bookalog selling bottom line personal in long copy with a letter and fascinations and all the things that we know how to do in direct mail. Now, this package mailed against the survey did probably, instead of doing maybe a 5% front-end response, maybe did only a 2 or 2.5% two front-end response. But instead of getting pay up of 15 to 20%, we got pay up of 40%. 40% of the people who took a free issue after reading through the Little Black Book of Secrets paid us. And so what happened was not only did it pay out better because we didn't have to give out as many free issues, right? We only did 2.5% front end instead of 5 
so I'm not giving away all those wasted issues. But now I've got a P&L that's positive that I went where I want it to be. And then the biggest kicker was that the person who read this book log, who then subscribed at the 40% clip, renewed at another 5 or 10% higher than the people after we tracked over a year who came in from the survey package. So in year two, the lifetime value and the value of a customer who came in from a package that they had to read 64 pages as opposed to filling out a survey and sending in a gift certificate, we got much better people on our list. And what does that mean? Well, that means the higher renewal rate, but then it also means they're going to buy more books from us when we sell them other books because they're more engaged with our kind of content. They're more our kind of person, as it were. I put that in quotes. And so basically, this is where the, you know, the, the basically how you sell is how they will respond and then how they will behave on your list forever. And so this concept has been with me my whole career in everything I do in terms of how I think about front end and back end response, how I think about lifetime value of a customer, how I think about how long a customer I'd want to be with me. And frankly, the one thing we have not done well at bottom line, and I'm almost embarrassed to say this, is that we really haven't gotten into very high ticket products. People who've had bottom line subscriptions for, for 20 years always tell me, Brian, I can't believe you've never sold me a higher price product. The fact is, I've been doing pretty well selling a lot of $39 product in big quantities because I have a lot of people on my list, like the people who responded to the, to the little black book of secrets. Um, that doesn't mean that I didn't make a big mistake in trying to get to higher price products, which we're working very hard to do that right now, but that wasn't my specialty. My specialty was getting, to, getting quality people onto our list and creating incredible lifetime value with the people on my list. Yeah, and the, the, so the one on the left is something they had to physically fill out a survey and then mail it back to you? It was a very, very simple survey. In fact, um, I think it was like one question or two questions. Um, um, so the survey was almost like a little I, – I have to tell you, we didn't like it when it was the control because we felt it was a gimmick. Um, and the actual survey question um, was actually um, – it was attached to the gift certificate that you see on the right. So basically, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're answering the question and putting in their subscription. Um, so it's, it's not like they're filling out a 10-page survey or even a five-question survey. I say that because I, I feel like when I look at that, I can see like a small business using that. You know, some whatever, some mom and pop, whatever, it's an auto shop or something or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Kind of using that kind of gift certificate and then, you know, copy. Um, but were you worried about sending that little black book of secrets? Because it's, it's expensive to mail that. You're always worried. I mean, the cost of, you know, um, it, the nice thing about that versus a big tabloid, we have these, you know, Magalog and tabloids, which are, you know, magazine and tabloid size promotions. And there you pay even more postage. Um, but you know what? In the quantities, I mean, back then, I mean, we were doing mailings of two and three million pieces at a time. And I'm not saying it was cheap, but it really did pay out. I mean, it really was um, a science in direct mail. The problem is, and in fact, you know, just today, um, there's a markup of a bill in the, in the United States Senate regarding postal reform. And as you know, postage went up uh, uh, earlier this week. And you know, the Postal Service is making it harder and harder uh, for us to figure out ways to use this stuff successfully, and they don't get it. And don't get me started on the Postal Service. That's not a light bulb. That's just a rant. Um, and so, and I've been very involved in that. I've lobbied on Capitol Hill for postal reform, and I, I will continue to do that. But to answer your question, I believe in this kind of stuff. And so the Postal Service is putting this kind of stuff out of business. The printing, you know, the printers have gotten very efficient in, you know, printing these things. You'd be surprised, um, you know, the printing cost that we used to get on these, even though it was 64 pages. Although we, ha we have gone down to smaller bookalogs and smaller magalogs. And the good thing about the bookalog, it mails at a lower postage rate than the tabloids and magalogs, which I mentioned. But worried, yes. But you know what? Dick Benson is one of my mentors in direct mail had an expression, which again, everybody will say is a big duh, but he used to say the best package is the best package. And, you know, to, to scrimp and save when you know you can put out incredible 
packaging and content and all of that, um, I think is just a big mistake. Pennywise and Pound Foolish. Yeah, and also kind of go what you said in, in the in a previous light bulb is you know the back end, so you're you're more comfortable. You know your lifetime value. You know your back end. When Correct. Someone, someone goes in, what does that process look like? Someone goes in, they fill out the subscription. Um, how does that work? What do they get from you? Oh, uh, in this in this offer, this is an older offer, but it's I guess it's similar now. I mean, back back then we probably gave them a free trial issue of Bottom Line, um, and then they probably got an invoice for the full subscription sometime right around when they got their first issue. Um, and then we would probably what they call grace them. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, this was a, I'm looking at it now uh, up close. This was a six issue subscription. So basically it's like a try. We, we kind of position it as a trial subscription that's free for six free issues. And if they pay us, um, so basically it's uh, six free um, and then if they pay us, they get 18 in total because they get you know the full year. In this case, we, we give them a full year in addition to what they would have gotten for free. Um, if they don't pay us and we go through the billing cycle, they'll get the six free issues and then we cut them off. I mean, when they what, when you say issues, what does it look like? What do they? Oh, get? it's our it's our newsletter. It's our it's a, it's our 16 page bottom line personal newsletter, which. Still, believe it or not, at that time we probably had close to a million subscribers. We're we're probably at about four hundred thousand subscribers. It's a print newsletter. It was a, amazing. It's a print newsletter. We still have four hundred thousand uh, wow. subscribers to a print newsletter. Wow. All right, that's great. Um, I probably have to breeze through light bulb seven. Yeah, I light bulb seven. Um, so I said learning the hard way, trying to sell prevention. So I, I was bragging, you know, all that stuff. I, I I heard that I thought it was John Wayne, but someone told me it's Dizzy Dean that said it ain't bragging if you did it. Um, so I wasn't really trying to brag about the infomercial business. It's something I'm really proud of. But now I'm going to tell you about a total disaster on TV um, so that it shows you that I'm not uh, – I, 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 not everything I've done You're is human. turned to gold. I am very human, very human. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, so I think I had said before that you know we were told that 1 in 20 infomercials um, were – had, were going to work, and we had three out of our first four worked. Um, we had the Treasury of Health Secrets. We had another. We had the Treasury of Health Secrets too. We went from Barry Farber as a host to Hugh Downs. Then we went to the Book of Ultimate Healing, which was again Hugh Downs with a live audience. And then we did a Secret Food Cure show with Carney Wilson and um, and and the Wyland Sisters, who are authors. So we had these these you know three out of four or four out of five successes and then we started getting like very feeling our oats right we said oh we can do anything in TV you got came, up with the, came up with this idea that I thought was just incredible um, and it's what you see on the screen here it was a book called Health Harm or Ripoff we partnered with a guy named uh, uh, Todd Cooperman who had a company called ConsumerLab.com and ConsumerLab basically is an awesome company they they test supplements I mean the supplement business is not Red, uh, regulated like prescription drugs as we all know and so you know a lot of times you go to GNC and you go whatever you don't know what you're getting and what Consumer Lab does is that they test everything and they give you ratings on the the, the supplements that are you know the, that have the most of the ingredients they say they're supposed to have um, they also you know tell you the ones that there was there was a thing in this infomercial that talked about that there were supplements that were found when they tested that had rat poison in them. So this was like an incredible show. And, and, and the woman on the screen there, I guess her name didn't show up on my slide here, um, but that's Erin Brockovich. That's not Julia Roberts. That's Erin Brockovich. Erin uh, Brockovich, the investigative reporter that Julia Roberts played in the movie Erin Brockovich. And, um, and her hair looks really good here. I remember she was like futzing about her hair the whole time during the shoot. Uh, and Erin was awesome. I mean, she was a great, and she basically hosted the show with Todd Cooperman. And, I mean, as I'm talking about this again, I'm excited about the idea all over again, that we got, we got interviews with people from the, um, you know, health departments about how supplements need to be regulated, but that since they're not, that this book is the thing you have to have, blah, 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 blah. And it was like a 28 minute, 28 and a half minute um, to me, it was like a documentary, and I said, man, people are just going to be – they can't wait to buy this book at the end of this, and this was a total flop, and so 
why was it a total flop? I thought I had the proof elements, you know, like I had with Hugh Downs, I had Aaron Brockovich. I had, you know, the uncovering of secrets, as it were, that the Treasury of Health Secrets did with Hugh Downs. But what I did hear is that I think we ended up selling prevention. You know, people didn't see their supplements as life and death as they did um, if there was a way that they could help their parents with Alzheimer's, which are Treasury of Health Secrets had some very interesting information on that and uh, using that as, a, as one example. And time and time again in direct mail, anytime we sold prevention or things that weren't solutions to problems, they just didn't do as well or in a lot of times they just flopped. And so this was a very expensive mistake to learn about selling prevention. And I think the light bulb too here that I didn't put on the slide was, you know, I just fell in love with my idea here. You know, and it was my idea with with my producer, and we fell in love with it together. And it's funny, as I just did this slide, I hadn't told this story in a very long time because it's painful, because it was you know hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of of losses here. Um, but it, it's a really great lesson to uh, you know not fall in love with your best ideas because they may not be your best ideas. <laughs> you know, the 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 audience is going to tell you what your best ideas are. That's very true. What I'm going to do is, um, so Brian, I really appreciate all the stories and all of these light bulb moments and you sharing. Um, where can people connect with you? I'm going to go to the questions in a second, but where can people connect with you, find more information, and say yeah, thank so, you? Yeah, um, so, you know, I put an email. Uh, is, is my, does my slide show up? The, uh, yep. Yeah, so basically, I'm, um, if, if you can email me, trexcowboy1 at gmail.com. You know, if you have any thoughts or things, I don't... I, I may not check it right away. I do respond to everything, so eventually. Um, I love getting feedback. I love knowing how my message is resonating with people. Um, I think that I'm in a unique position going forward as, you know, I, I, the, one of the URLs I own, which I'm not using yet, is dinosaursandcowboys.com. And I just think that there's this melding of the old and the new, and that's part of what I want to do with Dan Kennedy in my live event. So, you know, you have a lot of people. This is a digital domination summit. I figure there are people on this this uh, this interview that are listening to this interview that are either saying, I don't resonate at all, or I do resonate, or I could rework some stuff to resonate more, and I'd love to get that feedback. So um, I know it's dangerous to put an email address up, but I am because I'm that kind of guy. And you generous know, of you. Well, and I want to because I have a feeling that people who would be in your tribe um, – on on this on this uh, on this uh, digital uh, on on the summit, I think that they are people I need to hear from. Um, and then at www.briankurtz.me, um, the squeeze the, there's a bunch of content there. It's all free. Um, there's the main squeeze though is a uh, in the interview I did with Perry Marshall, and I tell the full story of the of the. Um, um, uh, hand truck and Barnes and Noble. I tell the full story of the infomercial soup to nuts, and then there's a third story in there about um, how I became the best list manager and why lists are so important to everything we do. And uh, Perry just extracted <laughs> so much out of me. Anybody on your on this know who knows Perry Marshall? Uh, he's one of my heroes, and it's one of the uh, one of the uh, things I'm most proud of that he would interview me mm -hmm. and actually send it out to his his tribe and. I got tremendous feedback on it. So that's the main squeeze at briankurtz.me, and everybody's welcome to go grab it. I, I encourage them to be on my list so they'll hear about the Dan Kennedy event, which I think is going to be huge. Um, and that's me. All right. And what I'm going to do, Brian, is I'm going to – everyone put in what questions they have in the live chat. I'm going to pull them up. And, Brian, you can go ahead and um, get out of your presentation and come back in as you – um, and I will just sum up some of the light bulb moments until, uh, Brian, you come back in. So I'm going to have yeah. a tech moment here. I'm, I'm going out. I'm going back to the yes. original link. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, and so as Brian's going out and coming in, um, there's a few questions uh, here. And so let me just uh, direct, make sure, uh, Brian, you can get to the, the Google Hangouts and then hit the... Um, yeah, I hit the link already, so I should oh, be coming on. And then, yeah, and then you can hit the... Uh, you have to end this call to get back in, though. You'll have oh, to, I did. Yeah, you'll have to end it and then come back in with the link first. So, But um, 
everyone put their questions in the live chat, and um, I'm going to just sum up. I know, Irene, you have a good question, and I, I wrote that one down. And just a few things to, to wrap up and wait for Brian while you put your questions in also is just to go over some of those light bulb moments. Um, number one, just remember that hand truck story, whereas you can, you know, you don't have to produce all the content yourself. You can go to other people, other avenues to produce great content and then market it and, or repurpose it uh, with them. Um, light bulb two, follow people's um, funnel. You know, he when he saw that 2 a.m. TV show with Kevin Trudeau, he followed that funnel to see what they were doing and what was working. And light bulb three was that deep dark secret, which is if everyone's zigging, you zag. And you know, a lot of people right now in the digital age, they're just sending out you know, digital books. What kind of physical content can you produce? Or maybe everyone's doing audio. What can you do video? Um, what can you do differently to make yourself stand out and also to increase the value of what you're doing? Um, and light bulb four is that persistent aggressive marketing. If you, you know, they saw something and they kind of, they did one headline and it's this, they knew they had amazing content and so they had that the headline, they changed it until it worked. And also just look on that one, on that one page, on that one slide, um, if you review this video, you'll see it, there's so many factors that go into this that is just remarkable. Like the fact that they have the headline on the envelope, you know, Brian didn't even point that out. They, they just do that stuff naturally because they're marketers, but just to put that, the colors and the, how they, they arrange it on the envelope is remarkable. Light bulb five, that database, just sending different messaging to your database and light bulb six, how you sell is how they respond, how you know they respond. So if you have a higher end package um, or higher end value, you're scared to put out, you have this amazing video course and you've been you know selling it, maybe some of that you give away because it's just you know gonna create more of a uh, a pull for you. And last is don't uh, you know learning, maybe you just watch out if you're selling prevention. Um, and Brian's back. I have a few questions here. Brian, um, and the first question is obviously you're an expert, one of the experts at this because you have you've had millions of people sending out newsletters. And this person asked, uh, "How do you make a really effective newsletter?" That's a really good question. Um, I, I do have there's an interview um, on my site with I did I did, did with a guy by the name of Mike Capuzzi, who's a wonderful online guy. Uh, actually, he's more than an online; he's an offline guy too. Um, and it was all about the newsletter business, and and I think. The, the old world of, and he actually wanted me to talk about print newsletters, the value of print newsletters, and this interview was not from 1985. This was an interview I did last year. So, again, let's go back to the perceived value of physical product. I think newsletters on the back end of um, a digital business could be so powerful um, that people get in the envelope. In fact, I wait for Perry Marshall to send me his printed newsletter as opposed to Kick, lick, going on the link because he sends it also with a disc that I can throw in my car. You know, don't underestimate that just because we're all like digital, all digital all the time, that people don't want the the tangible called the newsletter. As far as the the content, I mean, newsletters always had the reputation of being more inside information than say magazines. And in fact, Marty started a newsletter at Boardroom because he didn't get the funding to start a magazine. Starting a magazine would have cost him hundreds of thousands even back in 1972, whereas for 20,000 bucks he could start Boredom Reports. So the idea that it's all about the content and that the idea is that if you want to sell the newsletter, selling a newsletter at a premium price is all about what the content is. So a newsletter is not slapping together a bunch of, I mean, some people do newsletters that are just, you know, family fun and, you know, the last, what I did on my summer vacation. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, high value content and I love the concept of putting high value content that's even higher value on the back end of a digital product and that don't underestimate the value of it being print especially if someone's paid you a lot of money I mean just think they're gonna get a not getting a 9 by 12 envelope on their desk with a printed newsletter from you I tell you, Dan Kennedy still sends tons of of printed newsletters I know that people eat that stuff up so I don't know if that answered the question, but there's a lot of potential in the whole newsletter business. And the interview I did with Capuzzi, he asked me some really pointed questions. I did not think that interview was going to go well. It's like I'm going to talk about print newsletters with a bunch of online marketers. 
and I'm really, I, I, I am really proud of it. It, it, it came off pretty good. So I'd love, I'd love for some of your folks to check it out and then give me some feedback at my email. What components, if someone's, okay, I, I, you know, from what you said, I'm going to start and um, do a more extensive newsletter. What components do you recommend are a must to include? You know, I, it depends on the, it, it really depends on the, uh, on, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the sector. Um, I guess just talk about one of, you know, your newsletters and yeah. what, what you include and why. Yeah, so the stuff that gets read the most, I will tell you, in a broad-based consumer newsletter, are the really short snippets. You know, the, the, you know, and that's what I think. I think our in our e, in our e-newsletters, the things that get opened at the highest rate are the tips of the day, as opposed to the long e-letters. So I think online, I was just with somebody recently, and they have this incredible amount of content, and they, you know, she said, I want to start blogging, I want to start doing this and that. I said, why don't you drip it? you know, a tip of the day type of thing. Because I open my tips of the day. When I get those tip of the day newsletters from whoever they are and they're in, a, they're in an area that I'm interested in, I jump on those. Um, I will say, though, that they're, depending on your sector, if you're in the investment business, for example, I think longer pieces about complicated subjects are really important. So I'm not poo-pooing long and short. I'm not, I'm not making one, one blanket statement. I will say the digestible, we call them our BS, which stands for brainstorming, <laughs> on the back, which are on the back of our publication and bottom line, those are by far the most read. It's like reading the PS first, right? It's, you know, people just get that. And then our other articles, which aren't really that long, they're only like, you know, two pages long, but those are the longer pieces, the A pieces and the B pieces, and those are on more complex subjects. So it sounds kind of simple, but if the subject's complex, simplify it as best you can. Don't, you know, don't use more words than you need to, but I think... You, Newsletters do give you that opportunity to delve a bit, but I also think use the whole newsletter concept, both online and offline, to to drip content on a, on a longer. I mean, that's what that's what the launch people have have learned, right? The best people who do online launches, they've understood about. This is Gary Vaynerchuk again, jab jab jab, right? People know that you can drip the content, um, and it's a much you know much more digestible way to get your stuff out. But a good newsletter still can be. Pack. So I know I, I know I talked out of both sides of my mouth there, but there's no one rule of thumb there. There really isn't. I mean, but I love the idea of is, using print. Yeah, I mean the bottom line is you sort of have to test, and it may depend right. on what your market is and what your audience is. Kind of going back to one of your light bulbs is it, the messaging depends on you know if you're segmenting who you're talking to. You know, so you just have to test it, and for some markets it'll work, and some it may not. Right. Work. I know a guy who's a daily like a daily tips coach, and I wouldn't do a 30-page newsletter <laughs> to those people. They're 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 tuning into him every morning for five, you know, for three minutes. So there, I'd want to drip content, and my newsletter would all be probably all kinds of you know shorter tip content. Yeah. No, Brian, I appreciate your time. I have two more questions for you because I know um, I respect your time. We're running a little bit over. Um, one is so. You built up, and you talk about okay. We've sent to, to many people, millions of people. How can someone right now start to build up their list? It's a good question. I mean, I'm not, it, you know, I have the luxury now of a nine million name database. How did I get there? So, right. you know, and we didn't have the internet either. Um, but I think that one of the ways we got there was figuring out a way to sell on a bill me basis. You know, you get a lot higher response when you give away something for free than when you have to get their credit card up front. That's a tough call for online marketers these days. How to sell free? How to sell either free content or content on a trial basis? But I'm seeing a lot more of that, and obviously you're going to get a lot more names. And if you're targeting correctly, you know they're not going to be terrible names. They may not be as good as somebody that comes in and spends two thousand dollars and doesn't return the product. But talk to most IMers. You know they'll tell you that their return rates are incredibly high for their cash with order products. But the whole idea of trying it before you buy it is a concept that's kind of alien to a lot of online marketers. And that's one of the reasons. We, you know, Marty always said that someone told him with Bottom Line Personal, we, were, look, we didn't have a lot of cash in the 70s and 80s. You know, cash flow was a problem for our company. So Marty had to sell with a, with a credit card or a cash only. You couldn't, you couldn't get our free issue back then. And one of our list brokers said, you know, I know the list universe will respond to this publication. Why don't you just give it away? 
and that was the birth of our soft offer, which most magazines do, right? Magazines are not considered high-value products because you can get a free issue with almost any subscription offer. So that's one thing. And then in the B2B area, I mean, I'm doing it now. I mean, I want people to go to briankurtz.me so I can build my list, and I want to create a tribe of people that want my message. You know, will I sell them something someday? Yeah, you know, I'm going to sell them something that they want. You know, I'm not ready to sell them anything yet. I don't have anything that is going to appeal to them. People who listen to me today, I don't have a problem. Maybe I have the live event with Dan Kennedy, but I, I don't have anything. But basically, I just want to keep sending them more and more of my content and create a group of people around me that I want to be with. And that's where the best mastermind groups are developed. So on the B2B side, I think it's a, it's a real tight, not you have to cast a little bit of a wide net. I don't consider, you know, for me this interview is a wider net for me, because not everybody on this call is going to resonate with my message of, you know, I'll call it old, good old time direct mail, but it's it's really direct marketing. And the ones who do resonate with me today are people I really want to connect with and be with the rest of my life. So I think that's the, that's the consumer and B two B. I there's probably some other things I'm not thinking of on the consumer side building lists, but one of the keys to get to start getting into critical mass is the whole idea of a bill me offer. Do people still? Is it popular that um, people buy lists still? Or oh yeah, I mean they rent lists. I mean they rent lists, direct yeah. mail. Yeah, if you yeah, it's it it's it. The lists aren't as big as they were. That's why direct mail has shrunk so much because so many people got out of it, and the list universes that are available are smaller. This is an area where email is way behind. I mean, buying cold mail e lists. I mean, I know a few people have dabbled with it. They've tried it. They've had some success. Love to hear about some success from people on this call. That if they've been able to go out and buy a cold email list and be able to send an offer to it and actually sell product to it, that doesn't happen that often. That's why you have to drip content to them, and that's why the launch. You know, that's why product launch formula. You know, what Jeff Walker built is just so powerful. Because that's you know you're not selling them something until you create a relationship with them. Um, Dean Graciosi, one of my friends, who's the real estate success guy on the infomercials and a, a great marketer, has an expression. He goes, "People refund transactions; they don't refund relationships." And I always keep that top of mind um, in everything I'm doing. Yeah, just provide so much value, and then. You know they're gonna want to you know resonate with your message, and then when you do have something come out, it's gonna be geared towards what they want anyways. Exactly. Um, I, the answer to your question is yes. A lot, you know, list rental and list exchanges, huge part. Not not what they not affiliates. I'm in, in direct mail. I go out and I I actually purchase lists. I mail the consumer reports list for bottom line personal, yeah. and they rent it to me for one time use. That's a that's its own seminar on lists, right. which is actually there's another interview with Joe Polish on my site called List Management Mastery, and that goes into some of the intricacies of buying and selling lists. Yeah. And Brian, last question is, there's a lot of great stuff that you talked about that includes a lot of stuff in the funnel. What is one thing someone should start doing right now in their business that would be the most impactful? Hmm. One thing... I, I would I would I guess you know based on the, my light bulbs that I share with you today I would basically look at you know it, do you have enough can you produce enough content and product to satisfy your tribe so you know that would be one thing I would, certainly a question I would ask um, and then instead of just doing affiliate deals are there people that I could get into much deeper partnerships with because their product resonates so well with my audience. And they may not have the money or the so. Who's out there? You know, that, I mean, they may, that, that's not a quick thing to do. You say, what's the first thing they can do? I mean, that's not a quick thing to do because you have to do a lot of research to get there. But that's that could be huge, right? Because you could create completely new um, profit centers and business models by getting, you know, together with the people that resonate with you. Um, I also think that, you know, I think just being Figuring out what you can give away for free, whether online or offline, that can lead you to the sale later on. And, and look at there's so many resources available. I mean, I'm not the expert on that. Um, I'm a student of it. Um, you know, I long to 
to Jeff Walker's uh, Platinum Group because I, I want to learn about PLF. I think you know things like that are just so powerful, and it's a, it's another whole way to market. And you know, I follow a, any guru who's got something new to say about different funnels, and um, I think I think the first thing you do is you you, you just keep educating yourself. Anybody who's going to listen to all the other interviews besides me um, is doing what they need to do. So first thing, I, I don't know. I, I mean, like what you said, though. I mean, the, those two things are really, um, you know, a good starting place because you know, look for a synergy. You know, if you have great content, maybe look for an audience that would want that content. On the other hand, if you have an audience, look for some great content. If it, you know, it doesn't have to be your own, and and give it to them. And yeah. second thing is, what is the most valuable thing you can give out for free that's going to be so good that your audience is going to keep wanting it? So I think those two things are great starting. I got, I got another quick one. I think also look at your audience, look at your database of customers, prospects, whatever, and figure out what segments would make sense without going crazy. If you have a thousand names, you don't want to split it into, you know, 15 different segments but maybe there's a segment even if it's just you know buyers and prospects but then go a step further you know here are people that came in through my launch and here are people that came in through you know uh, um, uh, search and now I'm gonna create messages that would appeal to both of them yeah. and you talk to them that way you, yeah you're you right to, so you're, you're right and I found this out because I have a health newsletter that I send out and one person unsubscribed, and I ask, oh, why do you unsubscribe? They go, I didn't want all this health information. I just wanted what deals are available. And then another person who only wants this long health information right. on how they can help their ailment. So it's two se completely separate. You know, some people just join because they want a special, and some people join because they want actual you know, long-form health information. Yeah, I mean, some people won't won't be able you you won't be able to find the 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 isolated you know the isolated people. There's gonna be there's gonna be uh uh you know out, out, you know outliers. Um, but you but you could find pockets, and if you can find those pockets and speak to them individually as a pocket, that's gonna be incredibly powerful in terms of selling product down the road. Yeah. Brian, I want to be the first one to thank you. And in the words of someone who just wrote, Cecilia, he is a guru, an easygoing person. I really pre appreciate what he says. I want to learn more and more. Thank you so much. Uh, that's yeah, straight that's from really the last good. comment. So that, uh, that that's very heartwarming. Of course, I'll get all the nasty ones on my email. But um, and I know we went way over, so I apologize for that. But no, I appreciate your time. You know, check out BrianKurtz.me and say thank you. He actually was so gracious in including his um, Gmail email in this. So, Brian, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Jeremy. It was my, really an honor and a pleasure.